Good evening. We're happy to see everyone here today. Uh, and we're here, Shoreline Behavioral Health Services. We are one of the corporate sponsors, and we're happy to be here with you all today. Uh, we have a brief presentation for you. It's about 10 minutes. We will give you some time at the end of the presentation to ask questions. And uh, we have uh, Evelyn Cruz is here. Uh, she's the uh, coordinator of our Women's Recovery Center. And we have Heather Partridge that's in the back. She's our coordinator of outpatient services. And if you need to, if you like to take a look at our brochures and things of that sort, or if you have any questions, you can ask her some of those questions as well, OK? And I see a few people in the audience that I know uh, that uh, work with us and things of that sort. Really nice to see you, Deb. OK. Again, we're from Shoreline Behavioral Health Services. This is a facility that's located in Conway, uh, 2404 Wise Road. Our uh, telephone number is 843-365-8884. Our executive director is John Coffin. That's John Coffin. Now, the services that we provide at Shoreline can be characterized as uh, prevention services, crisis management and referral services, education, Intervention services, treatment services, we have both outpatient services and inpatient services or residential services, and recovery services. Now we are glad that you're here today and uh, we are hoping that you will get something from us that uh, will help you to know a little bit more about us as well. We have a panel of professionals. Uh, that will provide a general overview of the services that are available at Shoreline Behavioral Health Services. Uh, for those who are still coming in, uh, one of them is Evelyn Cruz. She's our coordinator of our women's services. Heather Partridge, that's in the back. She's the coordinator of our outpatient services. I'm Charles Bell. I'm the treatment director. And we trust that by the end of the day that you have learned basically uh, the value of the services that we provide uh, to our community. And you're a part of that. Again, we're Sherlock Behavioral Health Services. We are considered to be the county authority on alcohol and drug services. Basically, anytime anyone get things such as uh, DUIs, uh, most times you will have to come through us to get that taken care of. Uh, we have a variety of services that I will uh, talk about in a few minutes. We believe it is important to treat everybody with respect and recognize that you have a lot to do with uh, whatever it is that uh, has happened in your life. And even though we may have a lot of training and be experts, we recognize that it's important to treat you with dignity and respect. And that's the way that we treat all of our uh, clients. We treat them the way that we would want to be treated. We would treat you the way we would want our family members to be treated. We're going to talk about some of the services that we provide. Actually, we're going to briefly describe probably most of the services that we provide in a few minutes. Who do we serve? We serve all of the residents in Horry County and, of course, any other place that uh, you might come from and you, want to, you need the services that we provide, we will uh, provide the services to you. And one of the things that we don't do, we do not uh, turn anyone down because of the inability to pay. So if there's a concern from a payment standpoint, uh, we will uh, actually work with you and help you to uh, get the service that you need. The pay will not be a barrier. The warm back here. <laughs> All right. Now, how to get in contact with us? I did say that, of course, our telephone number is 843-365-8884. And in the back, we do have uh, brochures and we have uh, business cards. So if you'd like to pick up one of those on your way out, feel free to do that. Again, we are located in Conway, uh, off of 701, 244 Wise Road. And we also have an inpatient facility that we don't uh, normally give out the address to. We offer prevention services, as you can see, uh, a wide variety of services. In our prevention department, there's a lot of great things are happening. Um, we have uh, three outstanding staff members that are there, 
And of course, they work very closely with the clinical staff and the other staff members. And uh, they provide some of our um, educational services, such as school intervention program, and um, a variety of things that they do in the, in, in the neighborhood, basically, when it comes down to uh, working with the schools, using evidence-based programs to help people to know what type of things you can do to prevent having an alcohol and drug challenge. That's, those are the type of things that our prevention department uh, are, in, are involved with. Treatment services, and we'll talk a little bit more about those in a few minutes. Interwoven to all of our services, our philosophy about our clients. Again, we had described just a few minutes ago that we believe that you deserve to be treated with respect and dignity and that you have a great, to do, great deal to do with the way that you direct your life. We know that many times in the past there may have been a lot of confrontational approaches and things of that sort, but from our standpoint, we like to go from a strength-based approach. We like to use the strength that you have to help you to do whatever it is that you need to do. We provide client-centered services. In other words, it depends upon what it is that you need. We consider your age. We can consider your, whether or not you have any type of uh, disabilities, uh, cultural sensitivity. We consider all the different things that might be going on in your life to make sure we provide a service that will consider those particular needs. Motivation interviewing, that's one of the things a lot of people probably heard a lot about motivation interviewing. And what that is all about is, again, is respecting you, is not trying to tell you what to do, is not trying to give you advice, but to ask you, how can we help you to do what it is that you need to do, and respecting you from that standpoint. We're not going to force you to do anything. What we want to do is help you to increase your motivation and give you some information that you might not otherwise have. But it's really going to be up to you to decide what it is that you do. Outpatient services, we're going to talk a little bit more about those in just a few minutes. Open access. Uh, basically, Monday through Friday, you can pretty much come into our facility, and uh, we will do our best to see you. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, you can come in from 8 o'clock to 3 o'clock, and generally speaking, you will be seen. If for some reason we can't see you, then of course what we would do is recommend that you come back another day on a Thursday or the Friday when you can come in between 8 and 1 o'clock. But generally speaking, we will make special arrangements if we can't see you on a particular day to see you the next day or the day after. But it's important, your time is important, and so we do respect uh, your time because sometimes if you have to wait too long, we might ask you maybe it's a better idea if you come back this afternoon or come back another day. But your time is important to us. Right. Again, we provide crisis management services. Uh, many times we talk about when you first come, we have the intake process, the assessment, and things of that sort. But many times that's not what it is that you need when you first get there. If you come into crisis, we're going to deal with that when you get there. And then, of course, we will go with the intake process if that's appropriate, then screening, where we have different types of screening tools uh, and assessment. Everyone gets a care plan. Uh, individual, we have individual counseling, group counseling, and family therapy. We'll have to speed up just a little bit here. Um, we also have uh, educational services. One of the educational services that we have is PRI, Prevention Research Institute. That's basically sometimes if you come in, you have a DUI, and there's not much going on in the course, we would put you in a prevention uh, educational program, which is basically eight weeks and uh, two hours per session. Uh, then, of course, we also have outpatient services. Many times, if you need that type of care, you will come in one time a week, basically two hours uh, per week, one time a week. Intensive outpatient, that's a program where you will come to our facility, you will come three times a week, three hours per session. And uh, basically that's usually about 12 weeks or something of that sort. It just depends upon your need. Everything depends upon your need. We treat everyone individually. Okay. And we also have a it used to be associate detox and residential program by NICE the Women Recovery Center. Uh, this is, and, and I'm going to let Evelyn talk about that. Evelyn Cruz, he's the coordinator of our Women's Recovery Center. Okay. Um, the Women's Recovery Center to us is a very special facility. Um, it holds 10 beds. 
Um, and they're all women, and women in need, in crisis usually, they come through the doors with need to um, be able to stay in a residential setting. That level of care is high intensity, usually is 40 hours of counseling. And in order for them to be admitted, they have to be 18 years of age or older. Sometimes there's DSS involvement, um, or they might be at risk of losing their children. So this is a population that we're working with. Um, they also have to be willing to enter into treatment. You know, the idea here is that this is not a lockdown. This is a facility that you want to be here, that you want to be in recovery, that you want to get better. So uh, we really focus on attempting to provide the services that they really need as, as a whole person. We look at them as, as a human being. Um, and uh, we appreciate them from the day that they come to the day that they graduate. We're, we're very, really proud of this program. Um, we, are, we like the family support. They really need that. And um, usually the length of stay for this program is anywhere from 30, on average, 90 days. So, um, but the goal here in the Women's Recovery Center is to reunite that family, is to have and help the, the mother reunite with the child. So to us, that's very important, if, if it's safe, obviously. So the services that we provide is seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Um, 24 hours a day. Um, we provide individual uh, services, independent living skills, social skills, parenting skills. We offer family sessions, um, peer support services, case and crisis management. So. Um, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about this program or more about our population, we have a lot of information in the back and you can go ahead and grab some of that. But thank you for being here and for giving us the opportunity to share our services. Appreciate it. And we also like to thank Casey King for inviting us here and we really appreciate that. Okay, well, um, my name's Casey King and I'm the organizer for this event. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Uh, this is the second of three nights. Before I turn the stage over to our speaker, I'd like to remind you or to let you know that next week is the third night. So if you come back next week, 6 o'clock, you can eat dinner uh, in the Cafe 1100. Next week is going to be a panel of student speakers and student speakers that have come to me in recovery from various addictions. Um, and they've told me their story and I'll put them on stage in a certain, in a pattern. But if you want to hear six recovery stories next week, that's what you'll hear from our students. So it's various addictions, various recoveries. So uh, I think it's time to introduce our speaker. Uh, Candy Finnegan is a nationally recognized addiction specialist, interventionist, and an author. And uh, all the way from Encino, California, through Los Angeles, please welcome Candy Finnegan. Um, fell off an eight foot letter putting Christmas away. So don't do what I did. And um, I, you know, I guess I'm lucky to be alive, but it, what it's done is make me get immediately into acceptance and tolerance, which are not my best traits. Um, I'm really so grateful to be here. I've had a really good time today. I got to go and talk to a couple classes. And um, I want to thank Casey for doing this. It's a big job, and he's done a really good job at it. And uh, he got me. He's really good. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, um, I started on this journey um, to end up where I am today. Uh, 28 years ago, I stopped drinking. 
And that's kind of how I started on this journey. But before I got to this place in my life, you know, I was kind of a um, brat from Kansas. And um, I always say, for any of you who are interested, I dated all three of those guys, the Tin Man, the Lion, all of them. <laughs> but I promised myself I'd never have a dog named Toto. And um, I haven't. Um, but, you know, during my journey, I was adopted, and I came from a very privileged Doyle family, and I had everything I needed in every color, and um, kind of went through life. Um, now I understand it was very alcoholically, but at the time, I just thought, you know, I want what I want when I want it, and hopefully you're going to give it to me, or you won't be able to stand to be around me. And... Um, you know, a lot of my behavior certainly had to do with the disease of alcoholism. And um, I, uh, I always really mean from my heart, dream up. You know, you never have any idea where your life is going to take you. I certainly had no idea where mine was. I um, married uh, the man of my dreams. Um, and uh, he, uh, by the grace of God, is in recovery too because he really drank a lot more than me. Um, he's six foot seven and Irish, so that should give you some indication that uh, 36 beers and two-fifths of Jack a day was just, you know, kind of like breakfast. So um, I know. I, and then I tried to keep up with him, and I w it wasn't pretty. It really wasn't. Um, I, in October, I'll be married 45 years, and you don't need to applaud, although I really think I should get it. Um, and the reason I married that long is only one reason. The last 28, I've been sober. I, I think I had a really good time kind of the first 16 years. A lot of fighting, a lot of who drank the last bottle of what, who smoked the last cigarette, um, and... Um, so when I, you know, when I got sober, I really thought I would get divorced, move back to Kansas. I, I live in California, and um, and be taken care of in the manner that I wasn't accustomed to. <laughs> so um, I uh, I met my husband at Kansas University, who's an all-American basketball player, and um, I thought that he'd probably be an attorney and maybe hopefully play for the Celtics. I mean, I had this whole little thing hanging out. I, oh, by the way, I met him the first four hours I was at school. Um, his best friend moved me into my freshman dorm, and it was, it was hostage time. Um, and he got redshirted uh, in his junior year and um, had to supplement his income. And um, he started a band, a fraternity band. And um, here I am almost 50 years later, and he's still a musician, and that's another reason I'm happily married. He travels all the time. <laughs> so I really figure I've been with him maybe 21 years. And the rest of the time he's been on the road. So, um, you know, that makes you, you know, I guess distance makes the heart grow fonder, but certainly allowed me to be incredibly independent and have a whole bunch of secrets. Both of those works for alcoholism. Um, so I just, you know, my first, um, you know, a little over a decade that I was married, um, he would go on the road and I'd fly back to Kansas um, because um, we lived in Marin County above San Francisco in the 70s. And I remember it. So um, it was like I couldn't have come from two different worlds. You know, I was still changing my bag to match my shoes, and these people were making clothes out of their bedspreads. And um, I, I, um, I really married the man, not the job. And so he'd play with kind of these famous people. I'd never, I mean, he played with a man named Dave Mason, who um, was in traffic and was from England. And I called and told my mother he was playing with Mason Williams, who was on the Smothers Brothers show as a classical guitarist. None of it made it. So she went out and bought, of course, all those albums. And then I had to go, whoops. Um, the, I got one of the names right. Um, I, um, so I've had a really fascinating um, life is, is, you know, even being married because I didn't know who anybody was. And uh, I, uh, 
I love music, but I was never, it was never a huge part of my life. Um, so, you know, I was kind of always fascinated with it. And the day we moved from Wichita, Kansas to Marin County was the day that Alcatraz was on fire. The American Indians had taken it over in a revolution. And I'm going, how'd they get over there? Did they swim? I mean, I got to tell you. Um, and I had no idea what this, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll thing was all about. Um, certainly not the sex part. I was starting to find out about the drugs, but, you know, um, Kansas grows hemp um, from World War II, so there's a whole bunch of, you know, marijuana there, but none of it has an ATHC. So this gave you a really bad headache. And uh, so, I, you know, that didn't work for me. So um, I was a drinker. I'm, I am a... Um, what is my house? Oh, a tongue chew and knee walk and alcoholic. Um, I uh, I moved from San Francisco down to Los Angeles because of my husband's career, and I thought I need to have a baby. I mean that'll that'll, that'll fix me. Um, I'd never even babysat, <laughs> so <laughs> that was. I just thought that they kind of took care of themselves, and. Um, they didn't. I was. I gave birth to my daughter in uh, 1977, and the nurse said to me, by the way, you can't take Valium and breastfeed. And I went, how do you know? <laughs> I mean, aren't you supposed to be uptight? Um, so that was a very um, glorious time for me, but it was like I was so petrified all the time. And I really didn't start drinking alcoholically until my kids were born. And it was because I kind of didn't know what to do. They never had a babysitter. I, if I can't trust myself, I can't trust anybody else. And they went on some fabulous adventures. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I... Uh, I'm sober today by the grace of God and 12-step uh, and, and programs and my mother-in-law, for any of you Al-Anon people, she had a black belt. <laughs> and then she wasn't kidding. She retired and came to visit from, um, us for three months. Um, she was a social worker. Not good. And um, I had suddenly had to realize that um, I might get caught with this drinking thing. And uh, she would say to me, Candy, why are you locking the bathroom door when you bathe the kids? I said, oh, they're really, you know, they're really, real, I just don't want anybody to walk in or anything. And she'd go, really? And what it was is that I had wine underneath the sink in the bathroom. And so when I, they took, I mean, they were little prunes when I got there with them because I had a whole bottle to drink and she couldn't see me. And so, you know, then my next idea was, as I put it, in the toilet tank. It was cool water. It was running. It kept it nice and chilled. And uh, all of a sudden, one day, I woke up, and there was a plumber there. And she said, I'm going to get that toilet fixed in your bathroom. You, I hear you taking off that lid all the time. I went, oh, no. <laughs> God. OK, now, well, where else am I going to hide it? Um, and you know, it, it was one thing on top of another. And uh, um, March of 1986, she said to me, um, I think you have a drinking problem. And I said, I think your son does. <laughs> and um, she said, that's his business. He's not taking care of my grandkids. And I said, oh, well, it isn't that bad. I only drink wine. <laughs> um, which by that time is all I did drink because I'd had a lot of friends say, don't call her after 9 o'clock. Don't do it. You know, it's like, oh, I love you. It's not one of those I was doing. And uh, I never drank alone because I had friends in Hawaii and friends in New York. So I lived in L.A. and I'd start in New York and end up in Hawaii. And so I, you know, and then I'd pass out. So, um, you know, I had everything so figured out except for that someone had asked me to stop. And because of my adoption, uh, my mother-in-law said, you have until two months from today. And I went, well, what's the date? And uh, she said, you figure it out. She was going back to Ohio after the holidays. And I said, and so what are you going to do if I don't stop? And she said, when school's out, I'm coming to get the kids. And I thought, Ugh, I don't think so. And um, that's all she said. Never mentioned it again. Never talked to my husband about it. 
she did call my parents, and of course my parents thought she had lost her mind. Your child isn't an alcoholic. Don't you know who she's married to? And um, I totally fooled them. And, you know, I am so grateful that, you know, I was true enough to my alcoholism that somebody cared enough to do something. I uh, had the privilege of... Um, you know, speaking at these classes today and over and over again, I hear that same thing. What do you do if you love somebody? What if you do if you have a family member? What do you do? What do you do? And the only thing I can honestly tell you is please do something. Um, my mother and my, my father were never involved in my recovery. Um, they just suddenly liked me a lot better um, because I wasn't always asking for something. Um, I did the pour me, pour me, pour me a drink. Boy, I'm telling you, it really worked well for me. Everybody felt sorry for me. I was raising these kids by myself in California. And, I mean, you know, I made everything into a big deal because that gave me an excuse to drink at you because I was too scared to do anything other than barely put one foot in front of the other. I'm an overachiever, so I was every child I ever met, you know, homeroom mother and coach. And um, I mean, I just kept myself really busy. But I was head of the PTA, and the first thing I did when I got elected is said, OK, now we have to have boxes of wine. Well, I have this little, like, social hour before the PTA meeting. And they went, what? And I said, well, I know it's not really good, but listen, it doesn't rattle in my trunk. We're going for the box of wine. And they all went. Okay, and I would be the one, I'd show up with this box of wine, and no one would drink it but me. <laughs> and I thought, I wonder why I'm getting so much done here. You know, it's fundraisers, or, you know. So um, I was just able to barely pull everything off, and I, but I did, you know. So how could I have a problem? Um, so on day 61... I, not day 60, day 61, um, because I wanted it to be my idea, I went into treatment and um, um, called my mother-in-law and said, okay, you got to get out here, I'm on my way. And she said, really? And I said, well, you can't leave your son taking care of my kids. You need, probably didn't know where they go to school. Well, which is a slight exaggeration. He gets really angry when I say that. Um, but you know what, he, he just, it, he, I had coveted these children. They had been my whole life. And hardly anybody could get near them, including their father. And um, because I needed to be validated. And, you know, children had give unconditional love. And there wasn't a lot of that left in my life. And um, so I went to treatment. And of course, I was only going to stay three days. Actually, I think I was going to stay two. And then I said, OK, three. And I will be the first to tell you, I sat on the front step in my seersucker robe and pajamas and smoked pot. I was not giving up pot. I was giving up alcohol. And they were looking at me like I was from a, what are you doing? And I said, I just need a little joint, and then I'll be right back in. And they went, well, you know, how do you have that? And I said, what do you mean, how do I have it? I had my purse. <laughs> And they went, we went through your purse. And I went, oh, no, you didn't go through the lining. <laughs> so, you know, I, at that time, I thought all of this was so normal. And um, I always got away with it because I was, the, you know, if you asked me, I'd tell you. And then you wouldn't believe me. I'm one of those. You know, you go, oh, sure. I said. Um, and I went to treatment. And I went to a diversion program, which was in a 12-step based program. And um, you threw up and had diarrhea, and they told you you'd never drink again. I said, well, hell, I've been doing that for three years. I mean, this is not going to get me sober. But it's the only thing my insurance, uh, my husband's insurance would pay for. And in that interim of when I just gave myself enough time to get away from the control and to get away from the responsibility of who and what I had created, um, their doctor there was seven years sober. He was a retired naval lieutenant. And he said to me, I want you to read this book. And I said, oh, I don't know. I'm way too upset to read. He goes, you need to read this. It's like the manual on how an alcoholic is run. And I went, oh, for God's sakes, now you're going to say I'm an alcoholic. 
I said, that's the rudest thing I've ever heard. He said, okay, Candy, you drink too much. I went, okay, I'll take that. Um, I've never known an alcoholic. I mean, I really had, but I hadn't ever had that name put on anybody that I'd loved. And, um, you know, um, I would say to him, I just can't get through this. Don't you have a better book than this? This is so boring. I, I need to rewrite this while I'm here. And um, one more time, you know, my big idea. And he said, so since you don't understand it, you have to come in my office every single day and read this out loud. And I mean, I felt like I had been sentenced to, you know, hell. And I'd go in there and I'd read it. And he'd go, and what does that mean to you? And I went, no, that's not fair. I mean, you said read it. You didn't say comprehend it, understand it, none of that. And so, um, but every single time I'd go in that office, he'd make me read a section of it and explain what it meant. And I, I, I read it really fast because I had to go through the book before he'd let me go. And it was a 10-day program, and it was taking way too long. You know, I mean, he'd go, okay, we're going to go over that again. And I'd go, my God, you know, I've got to get home. Don't you know who I am? And he said, yeah, I do. I do. And if you don't grab a hold of this and, and think that this is going to, oh, this always makes me so sad, that this is going to be your life, he goes, you'll be dead. You're the woman that will be dead. And it won't necessarily be the alcohol that gets you, but it might be your mouth. He said, because you've got all these big ideas and you'd argue with anybody. And I said, yeah, my dad always said I'd probably <laughs> argue with God if he came down to give me a message. And he said, I'm afraid you would. Are you sure you're really that guy? You're dressed like him, but I don't, you know, that's who I am. I question everything. And um, I heard him. I don't know why I heard him, um, but I heard him. And I stayed and... Um, Two days before I left, my husband came. They didn't even have family programs, so they wanted you to stay as far away as you could from this. And the last two days of recovery, they give you, um, I don't know, it's kind of like torture, but um, they put you in a kind of a semi-coma with sodium pentothal, and then they ask you all these questions, and they tape record it. And then they play it back, and they go, this is why you're never going to drink again. And I want you to know that I told the person asking me the questions that I'd robbed a grocery store and that um, I'd been in jail and that, um, I, I, I mean, it was, it was, I said, that's my voice, but did you make me say this stuff? I said, none of that's true. And they went, oh, yes, it is. You took truth serum. And I thought, Really? You believe me? I said, you know, call a police department. I never robbed a grocery store. I went into a lot of them and drank, but I never robbed them. And, you know, it was like at that moment of clarity for me, I thought, the alcoholic mind. I mean, here I am under truth serum that they used during World War II, and I'm lying to these people, and they believe it. <laughs> Go figure. And then they used me as an example for probably the next 10 years. You know, we're going to check up and make sure that everything. So they stopped tape recording them <laughs> because they thought, I wonder how many other people are lying. And I said, well, you know, Dr. Johnson told me that, you know, if you're an addict or an alcoholic, that you lie, cheat, and steal. And I said, so I figured I would better put the steal part in because, you know, I hadn't done that yet. And I thought, oh, my God. And they looked at me like I really needed psychiatric help. And, um, I mean, I just couldn't figure out. And then they said, okay, you're well now. And I went, oh, no, I think I'm sicker than when I came in, <laughs> you know, because I really need a drink. And um, I got out, and uh, um, somebody was at my house and, and took me to a meeting that I certainly had no interest in staying all those sad stories, none of them were, you know, I mean, this woman said to me, so you had a really high bottom. And I said, I do? My God, thank you. <laughs> she said, no, dear. She said, you didn't lose everything. And I said, well, you know, I probably would have kept drinking if I'd have lost everything. And, uh, but I haven't left. I haven't left. And it wasn't that I thought it was funny or cute. The first month I did, and I went around and collected money because the chairs didn't match. 
and at this meeting hall, and I, you know, I gotta have chairs that match. And uh, the guy who ran this place, he'd go, okay, if that'll keep you sober, collect money from these poor souls and get the chairs to match. And of course, I called my parents and said, you know, I really need you to send me a couple hundred dollars. I have to replace the chairs because they don't match. And they just went, okay, we'll do that. Because they didn't know anybody any better. And I mean, but I'm telling you, I, I kept coming back. Because I had to make coffee in that big, huge thing. Oh, my God in heaven. I said, isn't somebody going to show me how to do this? And they said, no, when everybody's really pissed at you, you'll learn how to do it right. <laughs> you know, and I went, oh, so, so I just put a whole can of coffee in there. And everybody would go, you know, then the meeting went on forever because they couldn't shut up talking. They'd have too much caffeine. So I learned. I learned the hard way. And um, then you want, they want me to pick up cigarette butts. I said, well, please, are these handicapped people? They can't pick up their own cigarette butts? And they said, no, it's a commitment. And I said, well, then I'm not going to stay here. This is crazy. I've got to say, hi, my name's Ken. And I've got to pick up cigarette butts. This isn't. I said, does anybody know what you're doing here? This is nuts. And, um, but I went to a book study, and I thought, I've read all this. I've done this. I don't, I don't you know, I don't think. I mean... They don't have a chapter in there, you know, to the husbands. Why would I read to the wives? Uh, I don't have a job. I'm not reading the employee. So I like piecemealed it. So I went from 1 to 12 steps really quick and forgot all the ones in the middle. And then, of course, went around and said to everybody, do you know that you drink too much? And I used to have that problem. but So, you know, it's. Um, I have to tell you, this woman has had a really good time in recovery. Um, I can't take myself seriously, but I certainly respect the disease of uh, addiction. I, um, my kids were getting older. I had a meeting in my house for 11 years because I wanted my kids, when I said I was going to a meeting, that they didn't think it was something weird um, because I was a totally changed woman. And, you know, my son at four and a half said, I think you were a lot more fun when you drank. And... Um, <laughs> I was. You know, I'd stay at home and crayon and color, and we'd all watch cartoons. I love the Muppets, and, and, um, but I kind of ran out of the room a lot. And, uh, you know, I said to him, well, I understand that, but, you know, he said, but you make us go to bed at a decent time. And I thought to myself, well, it's because you're not my best friends anymore. You're my children. Those were my secret keepers. Those were my little children that whispered and, and looked after me um, and knew there was something the matter, but had no idea what it was. And um, the first time my uh, son heard me say, my name is Candy and I'm an alcoholic, he goes, oh, come on, Mom. What does that mean? <laughs> And I said, you know, it's um, this is what I have. This is what was wrong with me. He goes, I don't think there was anything wrong with you. I said, I know you don't. You know, we went to Toys R Us a lot. Um, my kids went to school, and they said, so how was your summer? Both my kids went, oh, my God, it was fabulous. My parents are alcoholic. And uh, <laughs> so... Um, the principal called up and said, do we need to call social services? And I said, oh, no, I've stopped drinking. And they went, oh, good. And I said, what do you mean, oh, good? I didn't think anybody knew, other than the box of wine, of course. Um, and I started in on my journey. And, you know, I raised my kids, and I kept my promises. And I, I just didn't know that I was changing, and I was changing. And uh, my across-the-street neighbor said, I got a great idea. And she was in recovery. And uh, has the same, you know, the same year of sobriety that I do. And she goes, let's go to UCLA and go to school. I said, are you out of your mind? I said, let's say we're going to and then not really do it. <laughs> we can go have sushi and go to the movie and they'll think we're, you know. And she said, oh, no, I really want, you know, to get an education. And she had been an actress and had I retired at 22. And uh, a year ago, last June, I was at her graduation, and she got her PhD. So she meant it, <laughs> you know. Um, and I went back to school, and I was so fascinated that I liked it, because I'd always struggled in school. I had an undergraduate degree. I was a dental hygienist, which is a whole other story. <laughs> not a good story. Um, that's not a you, that's not a good job to have if you're hungover. 
because I, you know, would have to go, yuck, when's the last time you brushed your teeth? This is so gross, I can't do this. And, um, <laughs> and um, so I quit kind of doing that. Um, and then I started paying people to go to school for me. So when I graduated, and my, you know, the whole front two rows were with my family. I was graduating college. Oh, my God, this is wonderful. It's a career. And uh, the dean of the school looked at me and said, who are you? <laughs> And I said, oh, Dean Smith, that's so funny. He goes, no, I'm not kidding. Who are you? And I said, oh, no, you know. And it took them almost seven months to send my diploma. And I thought, oh, God, I'm going to get caught. I'm going to go to jail and because I'm a fraud. And, and this is before I'd started drinking a lot. <laughs> I was already still kind of working it. And um, so needless to say, I didn't clean teeth very long. Um, but at least I thought, well, I have a degree, you know. What's wrong with you? Um, I, and, you know, as I look back on my life, I did everything to the point of where I had a fabulous beginning and a decent middle. But, boy, I just couldn't end. I just couldn't get to the finish line. And right before I would, I'd change and start something else over again. I don't know whether I was afraid of failure or success. Um, but I just knew that it made me really irritable and discontent. And so I, you know, I, um, as my dad said, you know, I started more things and thank God I didn't knit. I thought that was mean because I, you know, I'd probably be half sweaters all over my life, you know. <laughs> and um, it, when I went back to school after I had gotten sober and I had about 10 years of sobriety, you know, I craved to learn everything I could about how this had all happened and what did it mean. And in the process of it, I thought, oh my God, I can help other people. How about that? And um, it wasn't my idea to be an interventionist. It wasn't even my idea to go back to school. But what I've learned is, is if I can sit still long enough and have somebody else give me a good idea and then follow through with it, um, my life has changed, you know, a few suggestions. Um, because I'm not the girl you say, to, you know, you've got to do this. I'll go, oh, no, I don't. But you're going to think I did. Um, so, you know, I just started in on this miraculous journey, and I had the honor and privilege of meeting um, Dr. Vern Johnson, um, who was the creator of the process of intervention. And uh, I... It was just such a God shot that I got to meet him. I was supposed to be a doctor to be able to get this training. And every time he'd say, Dr. Finnegan, I'd just go, yeah. <laughs> Trust me, I, I thought I was a doctor. Um, and at the end of it, he turned around and he said, so does anybody in this five days that we've been through of this training, does anybody have anything that they'd like to tell me or um, that they have questions? And I thought, Nobody has anything. And he goes, how about you, Dr. Finnegan? And I said, me? And he goes, yes. And I said, oh, I'm not a doctor. And he goes, I know. And I went, how did you know? And he said, because you're the only one interested in this class. <laughs> and I was. I, was, I mean, I, asked, I was like that bad kid that asked so many questions. And you, OK, I've noticed you, you know? Um, but I just couldn't figure out how you could walk into strangers' lives, have them tell you the truth, work with this situation, and have them change that quickly to present to a person who's dying of a terminal disease that they need help. It, it fascinated me. But his whole thing was so spiritual because he was a minister. And uh, it all started when he would sit after every single funeral. And um, ask if there was anything that they'd like to talk about or some really wonderful point about the person who was departed. And he said, I thought, why in the hell am I not doing this while they're alive? And that was the creation of intervention. And uh, I said, well, how do you know who to invite? And he goes, the first two pews at the funeral. So I used that analogy, like, who's going to be Paul Bears, you know? Most of addicts didn't have anybody left who would even do that. So, um, you know, but what I learned is the most valuable thing he said to me is whenever you walk in to do this work, just remember you're the messenger. You know, this isn't your idea. This is something bigger than you, and don't screw it up.
And I thought, oh, I don't get to take credit for this? He said, no. And that was the defining moment for me that I wanted this to be my life work. And um, so I just kept my journey very close, you know. Um, at the time, there were no women interventionists 21 years ago. And uh, because, you know, at the time, the process was, you know, I'm going to rip these kids out of your life and, you know, you're locking me out of the house and you're divorced. I mean, it was just so awful. And I thought, I don't want to do it that way. That's, you know, I mean, I know how I beat myself up. I don't want somebody else to come in who's a stranger and beat me up. So I changed a few things and I just made it like care fronting instead of confronting because I'm not the girl you want to confront. And, and particularly, I don't want you telling me I have a disease that I don't even know I have. That's not fair. Um, and I compared my outsides with your insides and my insides with your outsides. So, I mean, it all just didn't go together for me. And I started in on this process and, you know, I just worked really hard at it. And I never gave up on being teachable. I, I mean, it's so important for me to always be able to learn. Learn from you, learn from others, learn from people who've gone before me, learn from people who don't even know what I do um, and don't understand the process. Um, and that's really where I've gotten all my grace from, you know, is that if intervention doesn't represent anything other than hope, that's good enough for me, you know. And I'm a lucky enough girl that I can say, I know how you feel. I do know how you feel. You know, whether it's drugs or alcohol or whatever it is, we all are the same. And um, that gave me such purpose. And then I started kind of honing my skills. And the one thing that I loved more than anything is working with families. And um, I, it just, I mean, I'm always so amazed at the resilience and the, and, you know, it takes really dumb parents to think it's okay if their kid tells them they're not using. I'd go, let's drug test him. Oh, he wouldn't like that. <laughs> I said, but we'll know the truth. Well, he would, oh my God, he's going to be so angry at us. And I said, he can be angry at me. And I was laughing. I had so many drug tests under my front seat that if I ever put the seat back, it was like all hell broke loose, you know? <laughs> my God, crunch, you know? And um, I, to this day, always carry a drug test because I don't want anybody to tell me what they are. I always go prove it. Uh, and then, of course, I found out about the, all the stuff you can buy and drink and it neutralizes it. And I mean, I've had several kids that had non-human urine. All I can imagine is them running around trying to get the dog, you know. <laughs> you know, so... Um, I'm in, I'm, I'm all up for creative thinking, but, you know, my visual of that is not good. Um, and, you know, so it's been one of those journeys where um, eight and a half years ago, somebody called me and said, so we're going to do this TV show. You're going to love it. We're going to have an intervention show. And I went, sure you are. You're going to go into stranger's house with a camera, photograph them getting loaded. I said, is there anybody in here who's a drug addict? They all went, no, nope, we're graduates from Brown. I went, <laughs> I said, oh, tee -dotty. And I have to tell you, I, you know, I don't know how this whole thing was created and how, how it worked, but they pulled it off, you know. I didn't get hired right away because I was too old. And I said, really? So you want somebody like five feet ten with big breasts and blonde hair? And they went, yeah. <laughs> I said, those people aren't interventionists. I said, you know, you don't ever hear a 17-year-old sing the blues, so keep my number. And I thought, oh, you big smart ass. You know, got to, you know, got to have the last word. And two weeks later, they called me up and said, would you like to come in for like a, you know, we're going to do your hair and makeup and see how good you look. And I said, no. I said, I, I don't represent anything other than recovery, and you people don't know much about that. So if you ever decide you want to do a legit show on helping people who are suffering, give me a call. 20 minutes later, I went, okay, so you don't have to come in for, a, you know, and I thought, what would they do? Um, and so I went in there and they had a beautician there and made me dye my hair because I was going gray. I said, whatever, my, you know, go right ahead, you know, and then I was so upset, oh my God, I got to do this for the rest of my life, you know, and 
are you paying for this? And they went, we'll see. So, you know, but I started in on this venture, and it was like 255,000 families applied to that show. And I have to be honest with you, I had no idea how they ever picked them. I would not want that in my soul. I have no idea. I mean, I don't know who, you know, what, you're a really bad heroin addict? Well, there aren't any good ones. So, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, and they'd go, do you know anybody that like huffs? And I'd go, oh my God, you know, people are crazy. Um, but out of the show, 21 people that worked on the show got sober. Um, and then they left the show. <laughs> they go, I'm out of here. Um, and so the, the honor and privilege of that is, is that out of the 234 shows that we did, and by the way, it was not scripted. There was, I mean, I, you know, I say this, but you don't know me, but I'm telling you the last thing I would ever do is compromise my own program or myself for TV. It was the la low thing on the totem pole for me. And I never dreamed people would recognize me. The first time it happened, I went, how do you know my name? Do you have a credit card? I mean, I just couldn't figure it out. And they went, no, we wanted to thank you. And I went, oh, my God. I mean, I just never, ever figured how the whole thing would come about. And every day I'm blessed with somebody thanking me for helping a family member. I like all the kids that got loaded and watched it. Are you crazy? You know, there was a big intervention show at Colorado University for every time you'd say something, they'd all, you know, slug it up. And I'd go, well, that's an intervention club. Okay. Um, whatever works. You know, thousands of people have, you know, realized that their family members and themselves have had problems and gotten help. It wasn't my idea. You know, I wish it was. I wish I'd created it and I edited it and I was in every show. But that didn't work. Um, I was part of a wonderful team, and uh, out of 234 shows, 178 people were sober, um, which is an astounding amount. So what I'm going to suggest you, if you know somebody that can't get sober, video them, <laughs> and then show them. Um, it's usually they have no idea that they're loved and what they look like. It's part of the whole denial thing. So there's nothing like trying to go into a liquor store and they're going, are you that guy that was on that show? You know, no. Not, yeah, you are. We can't say this. And, um, and it happens quite a bit. And, you know, what I'm here to tell you is, is that the joy and happiness that I was able to achieve by going and helping families that would have never been able to afford to get the help, um, afford to even know what to do. It didn't matter if they were rich or poor, what religion they were, what color they were. When you look at addiction, it all looks the same. It just has different outfits on. And, um, you know, I'm heart sick that they canceled it, but, you know, um, TV business is very different than the addiction recovery world. You know, they started thinking it all looked the same. And, um, they said, well, we'll test it out. But, you know, they had Duck Dynasty. They didn't need us. <laughs> they had the commander. And um, which, by the way, has brought them a lot more money than this show ever did. Um, this was the lowest budget reality show in the world. And, uh, but it's also in 34 countries. And um, I don't know how many people that uh, it has helped, and I don't know how many people, it's ruined their drinking and their drug use. But to be able to be a part of something that put hope and faith into recovery, who knew, you know? 27 years ago, I quit drinking. Um, and I'm not one that even thinks that I'm involved in this show. I think I got to be involved in having the stigma erased to some point of where everybody deserves help. Um, I've never given up on anybody. And my very favorite intervention is always the last one I did. Um, you know, somebody said, how many have you done? And I said, why didn't you ask me how many times I'd been to church? I don't know. You know, a whole lot of Sundays. Um, you know, when I was growing up, I was Catholic, so we were a whole lot of Saturday and Sundays. and. Um, you know, I, um, 
I was an intervention before, and I'm an intervention still. So the show didn't do anything other than make about 56,000 people who don't have any training want to be interventionists. You know, so that was not good. But um, it's jump-started into so you can get credentials now and you can get certified now, which I hope will help, you know. I, I can't imagine sitting at home and going, yeah, I want to be an interventionist. That looks so much fun. Um, and it is. It's some amazing work, but it, I, I never thought it was provocative. I mean, I'd rather be on a soap opera, you know. I wouldn't interventionist. Well, that doesn't have the status that I um, think a lot of people thought it did. But um, I'm going to leave you with a few things um, that have happened in my life, and one of them um, is one of my very favorite stories about my own recovery. And um, I'd just gotten sober in May, and it was the end of June, and my father got sick. And I thought, oh, swell, I got sober. Now he's going to leave me. And uh, so I was flying back from uh, California, and um, American Airlines had just started flying into Wichita. So, of course, my son thinks we're taking AA. He suddenly thinks everything is AA. And so I said, well, if you think that AA stands for alcoholic airlines, it's okay with me. Um, so we got on the plane, and of course they gave him these little wings. He goes, oh, look, Mom, I'm in AA. And I was going, mm. and, um, um, But I did think it was kind of clever of him. So um, we flew from uh, Los Angeles to Denver, and it was in June, and that's kind of tornado weather. And um, we got on this other little puddle jumper thing. And I'm telling you, I looked at the sky and thought, I don't think this guy should take off. That doesn't look good to me. And I looked out of the window as we took off, and there was a funnel. And I thought, no, now I'm going to die in a plane crash. And I, I, I know the headlines are going to go, Candy died sober. I'm going to kill myself. And uh, I thought, but it's so rough, they're not going to give up and give me a drink. So I had heard a man tell this story that he had been someplace and been in distress and he asked somebody to page somebody in an airport and say, are you a friend of Bill W's? I, I, I was going, now who's Bill W's? Oh, I got it. And uh, so I rang the bell and of course his door just come back and I'm just almost throwing up and brings like 12 vomit bags. And I said, no, no, no. I want you to announce and ask if there's any friends of Bill W's on this plane. She goes, well, for God's sake, stand up and see if he's on the plane. And I said, no, he's dead. <laughs> and I regretted saying that because I thought, oh, now she's going to have the little white coat people at the airport. And my dad's going to think, oh, my God, doesn't she stopped drinking and now she's crazy. Um, and... Uh, my son, I had hold on kids, you know, and uh, he goes, you better do this or she's going to do something awful. And uh, she and then she went, really? And you're, you're three and you're saying that's okay. So he made the announcement and it was like, sorry to interrupt you. I thought, interrupt you? We're getting ready to crash. I mean, you know. When, what are you interrupting? Oh, maybe their prayers when they're on the way down. And uh, I said, um, is there any friends of Bill W's on this plane? And I went, okay, here it comes. There's nobody that's, I mean, I wouldn't go. Me, can I help you? I have five and a half weeks, and I can tell you everything. You know, but I mean, the insane thing is, is I knew that they weren't going to bring a screwdriver. I mean, there wasn't any way they could even walk. And um, so I waited, and all of a sudden, the cockpit door opened, and the captain came walking down and leaned over, and he said, are you the one that wanted to know if there were any friends of Bill Wilson's? And I went, oh, that's his last name. Um, yeah, I was. And he goes, thank you for making a 12-step call. He said, this is the first sign of your recovery because you asked for help. And my son goes, could you get back in there and please fly this plane? You know. And, you know, um, his name was Captain Jones. I stayed in touch with him for a long time. At the time, he had seven and a half years. And... Um, 
it was the belief that I did something that I have, I mean, I don't even know why I thought of it. Um, because I really wasn't thinking about a drink, I was thinking about doom. And um, I, was, I just couldn't hold it together. I, uh, I wasn't that far away from a drink, and I wasn't that close to my next one, you know. And so um, that tiny little story has given me the incentive to always ask for help and always be there for someone else. And about five years later, I was in the Chicago O'Hare Airport, and I... Over the PA came, if there are any friends of Bill W., would they please come to baggage? And I went, I can't go to baggage. <laughs> you know, and um, what it was, it was somebody who had just gotten, you know, news that their mother had died and they were um, there to pick up their luggage and they didn't know if they could leave there without a drink. And I went down there and I thought, oh my God, I get to give back so freely what was given to me. Um, I'm blessed. I'm so glad you're all here. You make my journey just a little bit brighter and a little bit more fun. And um, I am one of the lucky ones. I am one of the lucky ones. Um, not because of anything else other than I have a life I never dreamed of. And it's because I heard somebody say, you need to stop drinking. Thanks, I'm Candy Finnegan. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> If I can't stand up, you can't either. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take uh, questions and answers and make sure they're really good questions. I'm kidding. Um, I, you know, I don't have the answers, but I sure think I do. And, uh, um, you know, anything that I can guide you to, um, help you with, um, I'd, I'd love to, uh, I'd love to help you any way I can, and if you, you know, ask away. See, this is going to be a really bright group, and I had to leave all this time for questions, and nobody's going to ask one. Um, okay, come on. Let's, come on, you guys. This is embarrassing that I did such a good job. Oh, good, hi. Yes. You have a question about the show. Yeah. Um, what about it? How do you uh, air all that, uh, you know, people sit on the show without getting them in trouble? Well, getting who in trouble? The, uh, the people who need help and, you know, you see them in, you know, stealing and stuff. So I was just saying, well, first of all, you have to understand that most of the, when we filmed them, we didn't show that show for five months. So they'd already gone through treatment, and um, uh, it's not against the law in a lot of states to get high. It's against the law to buy it, possess it, and sell it. So we kind of worked magic. Um, we were really nice to police departments. And, um, you know, we made their job easier. You know, we had two police departments that actually called the show and said, we got a live one for you. Um, <laughs> get this guy out of here. Um, so, you know, because of the way that it, it was filmed and edited, um, I think it showed the worst and the best. And because there was most likely a happy ending, um, we never had any problems. You know, um, I think there's only a couple times that, you know, crew actually hid keys and stuff so they wouldn't drive. But um, we're not responsible for their behavior. They are responsible for it. So we just happened to be there watching. Um, and the other interesting thing is I had no idea how these people would not know they were on the show. It's been on five years, you dummy. Um, and the truth is, the way it was filmed and the way it was um, almost choreographed is that it didn't look like the same show, you know. And if during any part of that filming, they got even an inkling that they knew that they were on the show, everybody packed up and left. That happened between probably 25 and 30 times. You know, a grandmother would go, just hang in there, you're going to treatment tomorrow, you know you're going to be on that TV show. And he'd go, is this intervention? <laughs> and uh, they were mic'd. And uh, 
they packed up and left because that was not the incentive of the show was to have somebody then start performing for them. You know, and um, so it was really authentic. I have to tell you, I was immensely impressed and honored to be with a group of people that cared that much about something that none of them knew anything about in the beginning. And uh, all those people really learned compassion and dignity and, uh, you know, how there's a right way and a wrong way to, to, you know, treat a human being no matter what they're doing. And um, we got a few of them arrested. I did. I'd call and go, hi. Well, we just did an intervention. It didn't work, so here's the address. <laughs> Maybe this will work. And um, sometimes it did, and sometimes they weren't there. Um, but uh, I always say it doesn't matter how you get here. It just matters you get here. So um, a lot of these people were in dire straits, and uh, wasn't anything good that was going to happen. You know, so it was uh, it was an amazing situation. Yeah, I've had a lot of people say, so did you give them money? How did they still have money? You know, and I'd go, oh, you don't, must not know a lot about addiction. We're really creative. Really. So, you know, that was another situation where no one, when the show went off the air in July, you know, I had all these journalists calling me and going, okay, you know, give me the truth. And I said, you know the truth. I said, I, you know, the truth, is, the sad part of the truth is, is that, you know, this is helping a lot of people and they're not interested in doing it anymore. And that's the saddest part. I said, they'd rather see, you know, people shoot ducks than shoot heroin. I don't know. It's not about me. So thanks for asking. Okay. Oh, there you are. Yes, I did study under Patrick Carnes. Well, as I explained to you, um, I studied under a lot of the great pioneers. Claudia Black for codependency and um, Patrick Carnes, um, who uh, was, you know, did sexual addiction. And, you know, um, uh, a wonderful woman named Constan, who was the head um, eating disorder woman and that I believe in deeply. And, you know, I studied everything I could and got every type of education, not because it applied to me, but because I wanted to be able to help the whole person, not just the ad addicted part of it. And Patrick Carnes is a fabulous man and he's really smart and he you know wrote that he was in the process of writing the book out of the shadows which is a 12-step um, kind of logical way through um, all different kinds of addictions and he was so honest and I spent 10 days at the meadows with him and I'd run in the bathroom and call my husband and go oh my god you're not gonna believe this this is unbelievable what these people are doing and he'd go, okay, can you go back in? I mean, I was like that little Catholic girl that was so stunned and mortified. And uh, But, you know, when I find somebody that's very complex and that I can't figure out what the missing piece is, I've done the work to be able to say, I think there's a little bit more we need to work with than, uh, than just addiction, you know? I mean, alcohol or drugs. So um, I, I begged people to let me come and learn from them. And... Uh, was taught by some of the best, you know. Uh, and now, you know, we're all getting older, except for me. And, um, um, you know, um, Dr. Carnes doesn't, uh, doesn't even do that anymore. And Claudia Black doesn't do all these workshops and seminars anymore. So I feel so privileged that I, uh, I got to be taught by him. And because uh, he's a really soulful guy, boy. And then you hear his story and you went, hmm. My God, I can't believe in the same room with him. And um, but I learned an immense amount of compassion from him. You know. Hi, um, I have a question. If you were, um, if you personally were to address someone who had maybe like dual issues going on, where they had a substance abuse issue, but were also um, in maybe like an abusive, codependent relationship. Where their partner was they want to hear you. I, I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, 
Where there's someone who's struggling with substance abuse and they're in a um, domestic partnership that's abusive and that person they're in a partnership with doesn't really want them getting help for the substance abuse because as soon kidding. as they do, they'll realize, I don't, I'm I well, I don't want to be anymore. with this person anymore. You know, which, which would you address first? Because Oh, I would both. address them equally at the same time. It's just um, if, if I, most maybe, everybody is either co-occurring or dual diagnosed. I mean, you know, for people that think that addiction is not kind of something wrong up here, every day you get up and kill yourself, and then you don't know it. I mean, that's crazy. Um, so what I have to tell you is, as I used to think, does the horse come before the cart, or does the chicken come before the egg? And the truth of it is, is if you don't deal with both of them at the same time. The other one's going to take over so quick you can't get a hold of it, you know. So I, I, if you have more than just one thing going on, which most of us do, whether it's depression or, you know, the old bipolar, which, you know, every meth addict has gotten that diagnosis. And, um, you know, and you don't give somebody an opportunity to clear and become really um, whole, and then try to find out what's going on with them. I think you're missing the boat. I mean, I want the whole person treated, not just the drugs, you know? I'm sorry, just one more quick question. How do, how do you approach that person if the person they're in a relationship with is, you know, kind of pulling the strings and keeps interfering? You know, like they wanted to go to treatment and then all I always say was... their biggest nightmare is seeing me come in the door. <laughs> because, see, I don't allow anybody to talk to me that way. I don't allow anybody to treat me that way. And if she does, there isn't anything inside of me that doesn't think that she's at such a low point that she thinks that that's as good as it gets. And if you get that person help, they might have a moment of clarity. And once you get them in that treatment center, you, you know, it's possible not to allow that person in. Thank you. And try to explain to them that, you know, what they're doing is as is as bad as the drug. I mean, people become very addicted to other people. And um, particularly when you're at a low point, I've done <clears throat> a lot of interventions in my lifetime where the, the, the mom didn't want the kid to, I mean, she wasn't going to have any life if he got sober. You know, I mean, she gets to save this child every day and sneak him 20 bucks. And, and um, they have no life when that child gets well. That's why I'm so deeply committed to a family program and to getting the family well, not just the person. That just happens to be the person whose eyes were on, you know. And sometimes they're the healthiest people in, because they're able to anesthetize themselves, you know. They have their little medicine where everybody else is suffering. So this is a family disease, big time. Candy, uh, you've got a number of years sober. My question is, oh. Was there anything that you ever put before your sobriety that you wound up losing? Well, I'm sorry to tell you it wasn't money um, that came before my sobriety. You know, I, um, I have, during this time in my life, felt I was way too busy and way too important to take care of myself. And um, I go down really quick. My ism is not wasm. It goes down. I mean, I get really icky. And I have enough people that love and care about me that they go, icky. Um, when's the last time you went to a meeting? Or when's the last person, when, when's the last time you helped somebody? And I always go, excuse me? And that's when I know I'm sick. <laughs> you know, I mean, what I do is, has nothing to do with my recovery. I think it's very important that I'm in recovery to be able to be in the recovery business. But, you know, they're also the business of recovery, and I'm not in that. I'm in this to help people who suffer, not for the money, as a lot of other people are. I, um, I just have to stay true to myself. And over the years, I watch myself slipping, you know. The old joke is I still go to three meetings a week because I only need one, but I don't know which one it is. So um, I always am able to find an excuse to stay well, you know. You were back there. Where'd you go? How what? How often I go to meetings? Well, I have to tell you, I talk to a whole lot of alcoholics every day in different realms, in different levels. Um, and um, 
I would say, you know, I go to as many meetings as I can. I mean, I have a home group and a sponsor, and I sponsor people. I mean, I've done all the right things that were suggested for me to do, and I'm asked to speak a lot. And when I go speak, I don't consider that a meeting for me. I consider that that I'm being of service, and uh, that doesn't count. I used to count it, but I can't count it anymore. So if I'm sitting in a meeting and I'm listening and I'm sharing and speaking from the heart, that counts. And so I am, I would say at least three. I always go to a big book study and I try to stay really close as I can because um, I don't want to get too smart. These people that graduate. <laughs> I, I, you know. God, can you imagine? Somebody said to me about two months ago, if they found a cure for alcoholism, what would you do? And I'd say, a whole lot of people are going to miss great lives. You know, if a pill is going to take all this away, you know, we're still going to be left with a whole bunch of ick. And, uh, you know, I think that's just a symptom is what we do to ourselves. And uh, the rest of it's all glory. It's all the gift, you know. And if they find a pill... I hope it doesn't work. I actually have two questions. I'm sorry, um, we were late. Um, do you think that there, uh, first question, do you think that another network might pick up on this idea? Oh, no. They wouldn't let it go. They own it. a and &E owns it. Oh, so they wouldn't be able to do another type of show? On um, well, that's, that's a possibility, but it won't be that show. Um, and it's just how do you, you know, have something so grand and then it's like everybody else tries to copy it and it doesn't work, you know. Um, I think there have been enough successes with that and enough failures, you know, that other people have gotten famous people and so I'm going to get you sober, you know, and that hasn't worked either. So um, I think everything, just when it settles down, there'll be a right time to see what's, what is the next, you know, self-help move that we can make to, you know, bring a lot of attention. I would die to do, you know, a TV show on family. Family after, the family before, and for God's sakes, any family. You know, that's that's my really my dream now. And the second question, um, I, yeah, I, I'm a dual addict. I'm an alcoholic, and I have a very, very bad, bad addiction to prescription pills. And I know that more people are we're hearing more famous people die. The biggest yeah. epidemic in the history of the United States is prescription pills. What the, is the pull of the pills? I can surmise from my own experience. That, like, what is the pull of the pills? And you take? Do you take pills? Well, I, I did. Oh, okay, well. Mm. And I had a relapse a couple weeks ago, and it was the pills. I took the first and then the alcohol. And did that prescription bottle have your name on it? No. Well, that's where it all starts is you give yourself permission. Um, to take something that's supposed to take something else away. Um, when I went to this summit for prescription medication abuse, they, their stat was 2,000 kids between the ages of 13 and 19 use a non-prescription medical pill every single day for the first time. 2,000. That's a lot. And... Um, We've created a monster, and I have to tell you, you know, we're not going to get farms out of the way, so we better try to get some kind of legislature and things that are going to prevent people from killing people. Um, we've done a lot about that in the, in, the, uh, in the state of California lately. The thing where, you know, uh, if, you, if somebody's overdosed and you call the police and you have a pound of weed sitting there, they'll come in and help the person and you won't get busted. I always say right then. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and they've got a new tracking called Cure that's if you get more prescriptions for the same medication from different doctors. It's now all uh, traced. Where it used to, you could go to this drugstore and then that drugstore and then this drugstore. And it's all going to be tied in by July of this year. And uh, they've uh, busted 42 doctors in the last year for uh, over-prescribing. And it's a mother coalition. It's a coalition of five women whose sons and daughters have died of prescription overdose. And they're the ones that did it. They're the ones that got this through. Um, so, you know, if you believe in something, there's a way that you can matter. It's 
Really the truth. You. Thank you for coming. And um, I've seen a lot of episodes of intervention, and it seems like um, you've seen a lot of intervention episodes, and it seems like in most of them, the family was the big enabling machinery in the addiction process. And in many cases, oh, they yeah. were sicker than the addict themselves. Did you require the family to go to Al-Anon or to get oh, treatment? Please. And did you get a lot of pushback from the families? So the first thing I did when I got to some place is I called Al-Anon. And I mean, in little tiny cities, you know, I, I can't get them to go down the block, let alone an hour and 45 minutes away. But I called uh, the nearest um, Al-Anon um, office and I'd say here's what I'm doing here's what I want you to do I want you to call this woman or man every single day for a week would you do that as service for me because they can't get to a meeting and they'd go okay I mean they didn't you know it's a lot to ask of a stranger but I'd say I don't have any other resources I have no other resources but you you promise that you're there for them so I need for you to suit up and show up and I never had one disappoint me or I would call him and ask him to meet him in a meeting and I'd go okay tomorrow night at 7 o'clock you're going down here to the you know St. James Church and Wilma's meeting you don't not show up and uh, you know it's odd what we'll do for strangers and uh, did most of them like it no they um, they're very you know they don't know whether the hostage or the victim and um, well, I always say, you know, you got a whole lot of free time now. Let's do something with it. You know, you're not keeping this person alive. And, um, you know, a lot of them just think that there isn't any life after, you know, keeping a child or a husband or somebody that you love alive. And it's very sad that that's where it's come to. But, oh, yes, I mean, I talked 12 step to where, you know, the crew would go, la, 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 <laughs> and I'll play, you know, and hand a newcomer. I mean, yes, I'm a big advocate. If you don't get help, they have such a less chance of being successful. Um, I really know that for sure. Where was the, oh, there. Yeah. I've been involved with eight people in one family. They were like dominoes. Um, yes, I've done um, multiple interventions on a, quite a few people, not hundreds by any means, but um, people that we would uh, see that wouldn't be successful. And so I did the intervention on the family. You know, the addict I can always get. But, you know, they didn't keep their word. They, you know, this one woman said, I'm, he's not living at our house. I bought him a shed <laughs> in the backyard. I said, well, where's he going to the bathroom? Well, he has a, like a portable out there. This is just so she can say that he isn't coming in the house. Crazed. Um, but, you know, it's usually the family can't keep their um, commitment to each other on what are the consequences. This isn't a one-time, hey, we're on TV thing. This is forever. And um, so I go back and intervene on the family much more usually than the addict. Yep. And they love to see me coming, too. <laughs> okay. Oh, there you are. Um, my question about opiates, in your opinion, I think anybody has a problem that takes them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we I discussed this today, you know, I've had a very odd change of heart about this. It is such an addictive synthetic substance that anybody gets addicted to it, including chimpanzees. I hope they haven't done drug testing on them, but it's that type of situation where if you start taking and it's one every four hours and all of a sudden it's four every one hour because they don't have any idea that why they're getting sick and this pain is back and it is ten times worse than it was originally because no one's ever explained to them about rebound pain. And so by not educating them, um, they get addicted to this medication and then a stronger one. But does that make them addicts? I mean, I've had a jillion of these, you know, older people go, I never had a cigarette, I never had a joint, I never drank alcohol, you know, I, you know, I need these. And I go, well, let's see what life is like without them. 
and they'd go, why? And I'd say, well, there are a lot of people that don't think you're doing really well. So you've got to get medically detoxed off of them because you can't get off of them because you're always sick. And I said, and I'm going to be really honest with you, that's called dope sick. Those aren't dope. And I'd go, yeah, they are. I mean, it's doing something to you that, it, you know, that one every four hours isn't working anymore. So, um, you know, those are really in, in really hard cases because it all started out so innocently. But I don't think it ends innocently. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of people that are really dependent on these. And they can, you know, i got to tell you, pain management doctors are going to give you what you want because they don't want you calling all the time. It's easier to just re-up a prescription. And that's, that's what we're in right now. But I think they all need to try without it. And you can, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll refund your misery for free. That's what I always say. Why don't you try it? And if it doesn't work, um, then you can go back and do what you do. Is there anything you can do to help a spouse that's so unwilling to get clean? Mm -hmm. And it's been what? like, that's so unwilling to stop drinking that's been doing it for three years and their parents are enabling them and keep well, enabling but, them. You know, the worst part about that, what you just said, is two things. First of all, love has nothing to do with addiction. And in some senses, neither does God in religion. I mean, I have people always say to me, I've been praying that he would never do this again. And I go, and did you pray for help? And they'd go, yes. And I'd go, here I am. I mean, it's like I'm the messenger, you know. It's um, And the truth of it is, is that until everybody comes together and has the same story, and, you know, it's very sad that usually something awful has to break that cycle. And, um, you know, that's why I do what I do, because I'm a voice not from the past, but from the future. And um, you just, you know, you have to get help. Um, and just thinking that they're going to get up on Monday and never take a drink again is crazy. And they can't love them well, they're going to love them to death. And I don't think that that's part of any family. Like I'm the only one that might would do it, but like I'm the outcast. Well, are you the only one that thinks he has a drinking problem? You are? Well, then, really? I'm sure his parents do. They just won't do anything about it but help him drink. Well, but is, are you are you the only three people in his life? I mean, he has no friends. He doesn't do anything but sit at home and drink. Well, I'll tell you something. It's nothing good's going to come of it. No, he's going to die. He's dying right now. So you know, you have to say, instead of getting him the help he needs, let's plan his funeral. Let's get him everything he wants for that last breath. And I've done that my whole career. Well, I can't talk to his family. Well, then there you go. You know, and so all you can do is, you know, pray for the people that still suffer. I mean, we can all make a difference, but you got to get in there to make the difference, you know. And if you don't feel that there's any likelihood that, you know, anything's good going to come of him getting sober, then, you know, the nicest thing you can do is to say, I'm, you know, I can't be around this and watch you love this person to death. Well, I mean, I've been gone for three years. That's, well, then that's really smart for you. You know, but you should always let them know that if he ever has a window of conscience that you will be there to help him. Stop drinking, not to drink. Because, you, you know, miracles happen all the time, trust me. Okay, you guys, that's it. I had a great time. Thanks for coming. Oh, <laughs> me out of here. <laughs>